church. It's good to see you all here in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I was looking at Psalm 33 this week, and I just wanted to read that to get us uh, focused on what we need to focus on this morning. I know a lot goes on during the week, and sometimes it's hard to, to get our minds right so that we want to worship in the mornings. If you go ahead and stand, I'm going to read from Psalm 33, 18 through 22. It says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Um, it says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So I was thinking, you know, no matter what we went through this week, whether we're having pain or struggles or burdens or um, difficulties with other people or um, disagreements or whatever we go through, we know this morning that we can put our hope in God, that, um, that his steadfast love is going to carry us through. And it just reminded me of this uh, song that I think most of you probably know called Farther Along. It says, Farther Along, we'll know all about it. Farther Along, we'll understand why. So cheer up, my brothers, and live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and sing this morning about um, God. We just know that God is fighting for us, that he opens our eyes and he helps us see what we need to see and to be able to um, hope in him and his power in our lives.
Father's house this morning, just, just feeling that love and, and knowing that God is just real, that He's just, His Spirit is here with us this morning. God, we just ask that you be strong in this house today. Lord, this is your house. This is where we bring our praises. Hopefully we bring our praises during the week, God, but when we don't, we know we can come here and we can join in praise with, with others who know and love you. So we're thankful for that this morning.
in this life, um, even though we do have suffering and we have struggles and we have disagreements and we have so many things that just make life hard and burdensome, we know we can come to you and we can lay it down no matter what it is, God, we just give it to you and uh, you're faithful, you're faithful to forgive and you're faithful to just forgive and God, you're also just faithful to see us through and you promise us we're never forsaken and alone. So just, we're just in awe of you this morning. Well, with that 
future and how it unveiled, you can imagine his new life came fraught with faith attempts, which challenged his devotion to God, not only that, but his willingness to stand firm in his godly convictions. And in the first week, three weeks of our message series, we've talked about and we walked through Daniel's faith test. But today, we're ramping up the intensity because we've come to Daniel's signature moment of truth. And what would that be? The lion's head. How many of you have heard the story? Daniel and the lion's head. Maybe you've even seen it on Venture Tales or, or somewhere down the line. You've heard the story of Daniel and the lion's head. And today we come to the point where Daniel discovers if he truly does possess a line proof faith. But just how did Daniel end up in the lion's den to begin with? Would you be surprised if I told you it was due to politics? Let's look at Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It will set the stage for us. And here's how it reads. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now what you need to know is that Daniel, at this stage, is in his mid-80s. And he has faithfully served in government for 60 plus years. Not only that, he's gone through three regime changes. And now he's on to his third king, a Persian king by the name of Darius. And Darius is so impressed with Daniel's service, his work ethic, his integrity, that he plans to promote Daniel to what amounts to be vice president second in command of the entire kingdom. But not everyone's ready to give Daniel the keys to the kingdom. You see, Daniel has a few fellow congressmen, actually we know not how many, but we, we know that he had a number of congressmen who had a jealous streak a mile wide. Probably saying to themselves, wouldn't you know what the king's Jew pad gets the promotion? I am not bowing to a Jewish slave. Mark my words. So if you're a congressman and you're unhappy with a congressman across the aisle, what do you do about it? Well, that's easy. We see it today all the time, don't we? You dig up dirt. You look for scandal. They basically say, no one goes to, from from slave to vice president, unless they're shady. There's no way. There must be corruption in Daniel's past, and we're going to find it. And maybe they form a congressional committee and they give it a fancy title, Ethics and Relations Task Force, and then they begin digging. Here's where they dig. They search for classified documents, fraudulent business deals, Kickbacks, bribes, money laundering schemes. They scrutinize, I imagine, Daniel's tax returns. They even depose his secretary to question her about Daniel's love life. And the Bible literally shares the findings of the task force inquiry. These are exact words of the Bible. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Is that not the most amazing congressional report you've ever heard? Right there. We can't find a single bit of corruption in Daniel and in his past, so we'll have to manufacture it. Look what it says in verse 5. In verse 5 it says, Finally these men said, We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. I don't want to stop here for when you look at our culture today and you see the downward trajectory due to moral decay, political upheaval, rampant violence, racial disharmony, the devaluing of life, 
Do you ever feel helpless? Do you ever feel helpless? Maybe you say to yourself, what can I do? What do I do? I mean, I know the answer to our cultural downslide is God, but nobody's asking me. So how can I make a difference? What do I do? And I suspect Daniel might have felt our same helplessness towards his culture. And you might not have wait a minute. You just told us that Daniel was a rising political star. He must have had a political clout to impact his culture. Yes, he was a rising political star. But do you think he really campaigned on a platform of God and biblical values? You think he ever campaigned and said a vote for Daniel as a vote for God's word becoming our school's curriculum? A vote for Daniel is a vote to end pagan ritual idol worship and institute the worship of the one true God of Israel. A vote for Daniel is to build back better by building temples to God throughout the entire Babylon kingdom. Do you realize, do you need to realize this, Daniel was never elected. It wasn't a democracy. He was appointed by a pagan king who had a pagan political platform, who served a pagan culture. Do you think Daniel had the freedom to impact this culture for God politically? No. And now his fellow congressmen are working feverishly to end his career and his life. So what does Daniel do? Daniel finds himself in a very helpless position. His, his culture is trying to cancel him, and he's totally alone. But let me tell you what Daniel did have. He had two of the most important qualities in a godly, a godly person can possess amidst a godless culture. He had these two character traits. Here are the two. He had God the integrity and he had God the courage. First of all, Daniel had life proof integrity. I want you to imagine all the resources of the United States government being used to dig up dirt on you. Just think about that for a moment. That suddenly the objective of the IRS, Homeland Security, CIA, FBI is to scour through your bank statements, your tax returns, your phone messages, your social media, your report cards from the past, your love letters of the past, your bills, your yearbooks, your projects, your internet search history, and even your diary to find dirt on you. What would that be like? Years ago, I was a witness in a federal court case, which required me to be escorted by Homeland Security agents to the courtroom. I drove in a car with three Homeland Security agents into Chicago. And when I got there, they brought me into, before I ever appeared in the courtroom, they sat me down at the head of a huge conference table in a room full of agents circling the, the entire table. And then they took out pictures of my home, took out pictures of my family, and then they began to badger me with questions. I tell you what, it was the it was the most vulnerable, one of the most vulnerable times I've ever felt in my entire life. I was ready to confess guilt, and I wasn't even on trial. Can you imagine the government scrutiny Daniel received, and it turns up? Nothing. Who said? Not even a charity parking ticket. The man is squeaky clean. And he's been in politics for 60 years. How is that possible? God be taken. As described in Proverbs 10 9, Scripture tells us whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. 
Daniel was a man who did what was right before God publicly and privately. And therefore, he walked securely. Does that describe you? Does that describe me as representatives of Christ to our culture? I once heard a hotel concierge complain about a Christian youth ministry conference that they hosted at her exclusive hotel. And here's exactly what she said. We hate these Christian conferences because Christians tip terribly. And not only that, they download more porn movies than any other conferences we host. Why is it that when our culture searches for dirt in Christians, oftentimes they find it? And they find it pretty quickly. But when they see true integrity, it intrigues them. Miriam Webster Dictionary has an online site where millions of people log on to search for definitions. And Miriam Webster actually keeps totals for the most researched words on their site. And far and away, the most researched word is integrity. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Ralph Whitehead is a UMass professor, and he said this, that the, the interest in integrity may indicate the continuing discussion about American values and morality. Perhaps integrity is becoming so scarce that people are unfamiliar with its definition. I think he's right. Integrity is so scarce, and when people see it, it sparks a curiosity in them. Why did you return the money to the bank who mistakenly gave you an extra hundred dollars? Why did she tell the truth when she easily could have lied and no one would know? Why did she accept blame and responsibility when everyone else cries victim? Why did she Refuse the gospel. And what makes him so trustworthy? Curiosity. It sparks curiosity. And I believe this. I believe that, that Daniel's integrity caused a lot of head scratching in Congress. What is it with this man? Why is he so ethical? Why is he so trustworthy? And it is an interesting that when Daniel's political henchmark is looking for plan B, where do they go? Daniel's family. They see in Daniel the source of his integrity. And isn't that our desire as followers of Christ? That our integrity sparks a curiosity in others which drives them to Jesus? Why is Mike different? Why is he different? It has to be Jesus. Why is Josh so different? It has to be Jesus. So Daniel's enemies, they spring into action with plan B, and their plan is to put a bill on the king's desk to sign into law. And the bill basically reads, anyone who prays to any god or any person besides the king for the next 30 days will be thrown into the den of lions. And there is actually an addendum, an important addendum. This law cannot be repealed. Once it's signed into law, that's it. But what narcissistic king would veto that bill? And Darius does not do that. He signs the bill with the law. And how does the man of integrity respond to the king's new law? Look at Daniel 6.10. Yeah, I'll read from the New Living. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open to Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Now, did Daniel realize he was the victim of a political setup? Do you think he knew? And I say yes. 
hands. I believe he did. And did he change his prayer life? Did he say, hey, it's a great month to start your journey? Or better yet, I'm just going to close my windows and I'm going to pray in my prayer closet. No. Daniel signs his own death by praying openly three times a day as the Bible tells us he had always done. Here's what I know. I want to know. But why did he do it? Why not hide? Why not shut the windows? If you're Daniel and you've built your entire life upon being an open book for God's glory, are you now going to hide when your faith is tested? Or are you going to get on your knees before your open window? For Daniel, it's no brain. He's going to be on his knees in front of that open window three times a day. You see, to be a person of godly integrity requires this. It requires landproof courage. Because when you and I live an open book, our lives as an open book for God's glory, our courage will be tested. Can I pray openly at a restaurant when all eyes are upon me? Can I pray silently in front of an abortion clinic and risk being arrested? I'm at a bachelor's party and the consensus is to hit the strip club. But will I be able to say, guys, I'm sitting this one out, it wouldn't be faithful. It would be unfaithful to my wife and to my Lord. My boss asked me to cover up for a discrepancy in the books. It adds, I'll make sure you're very nicely compensated but can we say, I'm sorry? My faith won't allow me to do that. Well, it's going to cost you your job. Courage. Godly courage. On May of, uh, in May of 1992, the city of Sarajevo was constantly being shelled by Serbian, Serbian forces. And on May 27, a long line of starving, desperate people stood outside a bakery which was making bread and distributing it to the people who were in line. And while this happened, a Serbian shell exploded in the middle of the line, killing 22 innocent people instantly. And I witnessed to the horror a man by the name of Verdran Samalovic, a cellist and the Sarajevo Opera Company decided, we've seen enough. He could no longer allow fear to control him and bully him into hiding and submission. So the next day, and every day after it, until the war ended, here's what he did. He dressed up in his performance tuxedo, and he hauled his cello to the very crater, which took the lives the explosion in the sight of the Creator, which took the lives of the 22 innocent people. And there he, he put a stool, and he sat, and he played his cello. And he did that. He kept his vigil for years, despite the fact that the shelling was still going on around him, the bullets flying through the air. He kept his vigil and was never hurt. Though once he left his cello for a short break, and his cello suffered a direct hit from a shell, and it was destroyed. To me, this is Daniel's courageous response. I'm not going to let fear control me and bully me into hiding. I'm going to come back again and again and again to pray openly at this window, regardless of what's exploding all around me. I want that kind of godly courage. Don't you? I, mean, I don't care what's, where I can say, I don't care what's exploding all around me in this culture. I will not hide my faith. I will not compromise my convictions, my strong held beliefs. 
but it's time to face the music for Daniel. In verse 11, we read, Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. The Babylonian cancel culture has caught Daniel in the act, and now it's lion feeding time. But I want you to hear what the king said to Daniel as Daniel's sentence was being carried out. Verse 16. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. I think that's significant. The king, the most influential person in the kingdom, recognizes Daniel's faith, doesn't he? He recognizes it. This is the God you serve how long? Continually. Look at verses 18 through 20. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the dead, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? If I'm Daniel, you know what I would have done? I would have, I would have been answered for maybe a minute or so. <laughs> but here's what Daniel says. O king, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in him. Sight. I get the sense that Daniel is the only one that slept like a baby that night. Maybe he even used lions as his pillow. But the sleep deprived king is so ecstatic that he issues two commands. The first command is that Daniel out of the den, and by the way, the lions still have to eat. Feed them, Daniel's a king. The Bible tells us that they were dealt with severely. They died before, it says, it even describes it this way, their bones were broken before they ever, their bodies hit the floor. And number two, the king issued a decree which reads exactly like this. This is scripture. I issued a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the Lord. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Do you understand that? power of the God we worship this morning. A God is, who is powerful enough to take a pagan king and make him a preacher to his own pagan culture. That's incredible. But not only that, a God powerful enough to silence an entire cancel culture in a heartbeat. And how does it happen? Through the integrity, God uses the integrity and the courage of just one man. One person. If you can do that with Daniel, what can he accomplish through you and through me? Through our integrity, through our courage. So today, we've come to the service we are going to recognize the integrity and courage of another man, and that man is Jesus. Jesus, I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but Jesus experienced his own cancel culture. Who wouldn't press until, until Jesus was canceled by being crucified on the cross. But what they never understood was that Jesus' ultimate integrity, his, his sinless life, and his courage, his willingness to surrender his life, 
would empower Jesus to be the one sacrifice which would save all mankind from sin. Today at this table, we celebrate what Jesus did. Our sin has been canceled. And as a result, we have access to God. We have the opportunity for a relationship with the living God. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to ask our, our worship team to come forward if they would. As I mentioned, this is the table, Lord's table. We have a chance to celebrate this together. And I just wanted to give a few uh, instructions before we come to this table. First thing I would say is this table is open to everyone. If you have made a profession of faith to Christ, if you have given your life to the Lord, if you have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, you are invited to this table. You do not need to be a member of this church. Secondly, the Bible tells us that before we approach this table and we search our hearts and ask the Lord, Lord, is there any sin in me that I need to confess that I need to, to bring before you so that I can come to this table and apply the same? So that is a personal thing that we do. In just a moment, we're going to get this mic back to and we're going to uh, the worship team is going to sing and as they sing, I'm going to invite you to come forward and just uh, as a word of instruction again I'm going to ask both sides to come towards the middle and when you come, you will receive a cup and actually two cups together, one contains the bread and one contains the juice and when you come we invite you, if you feel so inclined, this is what we'd like to do. You can, you can actually kneel at the altar and receive communion that way. You can take it back to your seat. You have some freedom as to how you would like to do that. So today, we recognize exactly what I talked about, the sacrifice of Jesus. And I ask that you would join me in prayer before our instruction comes forward. Father, Today we thank you, Lord, for his integrity. His integrity of living, the ultimate integrity, a sinless life, so that he could be the one time sacrifice for our sins. We recognize that today. And Lord, not only that, we recognize the courage that it took.